So uh, next up is uh, Corey Quinn. He's going to uh, introduce us to uh, SaltStack. Uh, again, I'm quite interested because I literally have not seen anything about it. So I'm uh, excited it's interesting. half of the room. That's quite reasonable. Um, the reason I ask is just because it, whenever I give these talks, it seems that it's the audience is sort of varied as far as their level of experience, level of exposure. Uh, some people never even heard of it before and just wanted a seat in a room they could actually get into. Other people have been contributing for it for years and just want to ask fun questions at the end. Um, it's an interesting place. Um, first off, I'd like to apologize a little bit. Uh, they cut, wound up cutting times on these presentations, so I know I promised a demo in the uh, in the uh, write up, but unfortunately, we're not going to be able to deliver that at this point. But we do what we can. Um, sorry for the false advertising on this. Okay, so who am I? Uh, to answer the question initially, I do not work for SaltStack, although Dave in the corner does, who will be fact-checking me on everything I say that's stupid, which is most things. Uh, I'm a technical consultant at Taos, a company based out of uh, the greater Bay Area in California. Uh, I'm also staff for the Freenode IRC network in my spare time, where we contribute to things like FOSDAP. And I was number 15 to contribute to SALT, uh, which is kind of awesome that we're both 500 now. It's, uh, <laughs> it lets me talk about uh, things I remember way back when. Uh, at the moment, I'm currently packaging it for homebrew for Mac, but I uh, spent an interesting year as the Ubuntu packager as well. Um, and didn't make it onto the slide, but three days ago, I wound up passing the newly created uh, SaltStack Certified Engineering Certification. Fantastic. That, that one on the resume. Oh, yes. Okay, so what is SALT? Um, this is not going to be an in-depth explanation of everything that SALT does, because at this point, the project has grown and blossomed in such a way that this would take several hours to go through, and frankly, no one has that kind of attention span, at least of all me. Um, we're going to be relatively high level, uh, an overview of what it does, and I'm going to come back toward the end with a couple of the high level features that SALT does that you may not have heard of. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the basics of what SALT actually is. Uh, it's configuration management, meaning remote execution. Um, and as far as what those are, let's break them down one at a time. Configuration management, as I see it, really consists of five primitives. And there's no configuration management system out there that I'm aware of that doesn't do these five things. Uh, as once, you can, once you wind up achieving all of these, you effectively have control of the number. And that's not particularly difficult these days, and it's not hugely interesting. Everyone does it, but the question is, is what, out, what else is actually out there? Uh, analyst studies have shown that anywhere between 4 to 10 percent of companies out there are running a configuration management system that was not developed for the house. So far and away, the most common thing people are still using in 2014 is SSH in a for loop, or something built around RC. This is somewhat unfortunate, given that people are reinventing an awful lot of wheels. And it doesn't necessarily have to be there. Um, okay, now that we've covered what your configuration management is, there's really only one primitive for remote execution, which is to do the thing over there. Uh, you can think of it like a flamethrower. Basically, I want to set that thing over there on fire. Done. Problem solved. Um, the nice thing about salt is that it leverages a message bus to do this. So you can do the thing everywhere, or on a very clearly defined subset of things. And it winds up, so you're not going to, you're not going to doing this in series. You're actually going parallel throughout your entire environment. Uh, and at this point, it does scale to tens of thousands of nodes. And this has been tested in a number of environments. Uh, LinkedIn, for example, is currently running this at that scale. It's kind of an interesting thing to say. So one of the things that uh, I really want to dive into what makes it a little bit uh, interesting compared to other contenders in this space 
is the simplicity of the configuration. It doesn't have anything approaching a DSL. It's pure YAML at this point. In fact, this is not an abbreviated example. This is actually taken out of uh, running production environment. Uh, it starts off by defining all this does is handles HTTP. Uh, unlike a lot of entrants in this space, one thing that's probably worth pointing out is that it is proceeded. It actually it does have a dependency model that goes top to bottom, which is nice. It doesn't randomly uh, allocate that. That was actually added in relatively recent generations. So it starts off with, uh, obviously, defining that the package has to be installed. It does that. It then winds up managing the file itself, obviously the configuration file, uh, and it gives it a source. That source can be a static file on disk. It can also be templated up with Jinja, which we're not going to dive too heavily into. And one thing that I want to point out as well is that it then defines the service as running. And I forgot to call them there. Uh, at that point, it, uh, it watches the file, so it will restart the service when that file changes. And lastly, what I want to point out that makes this a little bit interesting is the require statement at the end. Um, if it goes top to bottom, then why would I bother to put in a require there? Uh, simply put, because if I don't require it, and something goes wrong putting that configuration file into place, it'll just continue iterating through. If that require fails, it will not start the service, which actually winds up providing a nice fail set. Uh, picture a scenario of deploying, of adding a load balancer, or adding a web server to a load balancer, where you don't actually have static assets in place on the web server. It, that's how you tend to have embarrassing production outages. Okay, one other interesting thing as well that takes it a bit beyond this is something called the event reactor system. And this is where Salt really winds up shining. Uh, you just saw the dependency model that I laid out. That was not a random thing. Uh, because what this does is effectively does the same thing. If a file changes, restart the service. If this, then that. What the event reactor winds up buying us is it gives us that same type of dependency model, only we're no longer talking about a single node. Uh, we're talking about things like if, the lo if this web server comes up, then add it to the load balancer. If that server load exceeds a certain threshold, remove it from the load balancer. You essentially wind up being able to map dependencies and uh, have cause and effect relationships throughout your entire environment. This is something that uh, traditional systems, particularly our old friend, our sync and SSH, tend not to do as well as you would hope. Um, it's environmental orchestration, and that's sort of a new and interesting thing. Something else that's been included in SALT for a while as well is called SALT Vert. Um, it's actually a built-in part of SALT. It's not a separate project. And this buys us a few interesting things. Um, specifically, it lets us deploy virtual machines. Today, KVM is the number one, uh, so is the only first class citizen, although support for LXC is coming up, as well as XAMPP. Uh, at SaltConf three days ago, we were also given an interesting presentation on how it integrates well with Docker, uh, which was presented here two talks ago. It's really turning into an interesting space. Um, what this winds up doing is this adds a great abstraction layer on the business of instantiating and running VMs. Uh, being able to pre-seed the image with its own, with uh, Salt's configuration management system means you, have been, you can decide to spin up a VM on a particular hypervisor in your environment, and it comes up automatically populated, which is rather nice. But at that point, that's a neat idea, but it also starts speaking to something that's a little bit uh, higher level, and that's called Salt Cloud. <laughs> what this does is it winds up uh, provisioning into both private and public clouds. Yes, welcome to the cloud. It's where we have ops. <laughs> uh, in the next Salt release, this is actually going to be merged in as well as, as a uh, component of Salt, no longer a separate project. Uh, that's already been done in the current release candidate, which we're expecting to release this coming week. Um, and what this serves as is an interface to cloud providers, which is fairly comprehensive at this point. And what this does is it's not just a list of, ooh, look at all the things that we support, but this represents something that we tend to be driving towards as an industry, you know, whether we realize it or not. Um, for example, as a consultant, I wind up speaking to a number of companies that are doing migrations either into or out of AWS, <laughs> moving it in because of the rapid provisioning and instantiation of environments, and moving out because holy crap is it expensive to do it at scale. 
Uh, when you can build a data center for what you're uh, spending in Amazon in less than three months, it's really time to consider maybe doing something else. The problem is, and the reason I pick on Amazon for this, is that they are obviously the market leader with a lot of very interesting platform-specific services. Uh, take RDS, their database service. That's great, but no one else really offers a database service at that same layer. So what, the, what this really speaks to is what it's going to take going forward as we start building out uh, cloud environments that are truly portable, is that we also have to wind up building services as well, rather than relying on the ones that providers can do us. If you, rather than going with RDS potentially, you instead define some form of, uh, you design a state within salt or whatever you're using, this doesn't need to be salt specific, and you wind up spinning up your database service inside of the container. If you wind up restricting your interaction with AWS or any other cloud that you're using to basic primitives, stand up an instance, spin down an instance, add it to a load balancing layer, and then have everything else defined in terms of what happens once those instances are up, you've bought yourself tremendous portability. Obviously, it does wind up being sort of a less and you have to figure out how to scale it to sooner rather than later, as opposed to once you try to move off and then reinvent the wheel that's already uh, bought you a tremendous amount of technical debt. Uh, this is sort of becoming a new best practice in the industry that some of us haven't quite fully realized yet until we wind up smacking us on the face a couple of times. As a consultant, I get to see it a lot, but people who are embedded in various shops either just starting to realize it and don't have the luxury of moving on to a new project in six months so they can forget and do it better next time. So it's definitely worth calling out as one of those dependencies. Um, if you manage to target uh, common APIs, your migrations wind up hurting a lot less. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we're definitely looking at a point now where there's a transition in going on in the configuration management state, uh, the configuration management space. Node management has been relatively solid for a number of years. It started with CF Engine, then Puppet and Chef wound up addressing that. But now with things that are coming up like Salt and Ansel, we're really starting to talk a little bit more about the ability to manage entire environments. When you start thinking more holistically and being able to interface between different, uh, different <coughs> services, that really becomes a powerful thing. And it drives towards a new way of looking at your environment. So. The real fun part about this is, so what, I've talked a little bit about what's coming, but specific to Sol, what's next? What is it that uh, we're looking to wind up doing? Uh, it's a hard question to answer because probably in the time I've been giving this talk, three new pull requests have come in, each with a new feature. Uh, it, to say that Salt moves rapidly is uh, being a little bit uh, <laughs> understating the case. Uh, there's currently a project in the works that's going to significantly shore up the integration with Docker. Uh, it's already working in an early alpha stage, but it's not there yet. Uh, and there's a separate project that I want to go into very slightly that's uh, actually, sorry, before I dive into this, uh, one thing that's interesting about <laughs> Sol today is that it's built on top of Zero MQ, which serves as the transport layer. Very soon, that's going to be replaced with a uh, transport that by default uses UDP, could also be uh, TCP as well. It's currently in development and is just announced this week called Rate. It's, uh, this is sort of new. It hasn't this hasn't really hit the uh, configuration management space, so you're pretty much here seeing it here first. Hooray, secrets. Uh, what this does is it makes the communication protocol very pluggable. You can drop in uh, zero MQ, which is there today. You can use salt SSH and run the whole thing agentless and just use our old friend SSH. But now you can also drop in this as well, which is sort of forcing a refactor of how things have been addressed before, which means other, other transport layers are available in the future. Uh, what this does is it uh, means that your actual queues wind up, uh, you have multiple queues per socket, which allows for things like packet prioritization, and it scales up rapidly. This very realistically takes salt from being able to scale from tens of thousands of nodes to hundreds of thousands of nodes, which is turning into something relatively interesting. Not a lot of companies are at that space yet, but it's coming, and it's really neat to be able to see it. At this point, uh, it also winds up kicking encryption down to the socket layer, which is rather convenient, because at that point, encryption becomes pluggable as well. The value of that is that it uh, winds up using published crypto libraries, which means that at this point, Salt can actually get out of handling the crypto space itself, which uh, in the past has led to some interesting challenges, as I'm sure some of you have heard. <laughs> at this point, uh, that's, this has been my talk, and if you had any, uh, this is something I've been riveted by. It's something I've been talking about for over a couple of years now. 
and it's something that I really hope that uh, people wind up seeing a bit more of. Um, the next talk, just so you're all aware, is uh, David Ludercord from Puppet Labs, who's going to talk about a project that's near and dear to my heart, uh, provisioning with Razor. So it's definitely worth sticking around if you're on the fence about it. Are there any questions I can answer for anyone? Yes. To whom? Never heard of it. <laughs> Sorry, so <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. You're right, it is. Uh, what's interesting is the way that you can actually wind up structuring your state tree. You can lead to a very clear separation. There are a number of shops as well today that are using salt to orchestrate existing puppet or shaft environments uh, to use existing uh, other systems entirely for management of nodes but then turn into salt for the ability to, orca to uh, essentially orchestrate those environments. Um, at its very basic level, it acts as an incredibly powerful replacement for SSH in a form. If, that, if all you're ever using it for is to kick off runs of your puppet nodes, uh, just so you don't wind up uh, having everything fire at once and uh, destroy your puppet master, that alone is sometimes worth looking into. Does that answer your question? Uh, I yes. Okay. Anyone else at this point? Thank you all very much for your time. Oh, so uh, we have uh, like 15 more minutes. If you have something of like a demo or something. Not prepared at this point. I was still 25 minutes in the most. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. In that case, uh, we'll. Uh, the interpretive dance? Wow! Climb on the table and. Uh, <laughs> All right, then uh, I guess we'll have a little uh, a little break um, because uh, otherwise we're going to be too much ahead of the schedule. So we'll just uh, take a 15 minute break and then we'll uh, continue with the next talk. Thank you very much.